just want to make sure we're all here. So Elmwood, El Emerald Ridge, are you guys here? Hi, uh, Weber Academy, Belmont, there you are, and C.W. Perry School. Hey, how are you guys? Okay, so um, today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about my career in space and the different types of jobs that I've had over the last almost 10 years working at the Canadian Space Agency. So I'll just start my presentation. Share screen, where's that? Okay, I'm gonna get some help to share my presentation with you guys. Okay, so if everyone can see that page, my career in space, give me a big thumbs up. I see a whole bunch of thumbs up, great, perfect. All right, so my career in space. When you think about space, a lot of the times we think um, it's only engineers that work in space, but that's really not the case. Although at the space agency, most of the people working here are engineers. We work with a lot of different uh, professionals as well. We work with satellite operators, astrophysicists who let us know how planets and stars and the, the moon and the sun are moving in space and why they move in the ways that they do. We have climate scientists, climatologists that let us know for our satellites that we, we own and operate. What kind of data do they want to see in terms of climate change? Geographers. So if you live uh, in the prairie provinces and you want to look at how the soil is moving or the earth is moving from year to year, or you want to look, uh, for example, a farmer wants to look at soil composition and see which soil should I grow my crop on this year? We need specialty, uh, specialists in those fields to let us know what kind of uh, data that we need to develop here at the Canadian Space Agency. We have physicists, mathematicians, biologists. We have doctors and psychologists. So though the doctors and psychologists, they support our astronauts who go six months away from their families in space, floating around, around our Earth. You can imagine that has a lot of impact on them, both physically, but also emotionally. They miss their family and friends. They miss putting their feet on the ground. So we have psychologists and doctors that work with us, geologists, lawyers, policy analysts. Um, if you're interested in politics, but you're also interested in space, you can help develop all the laws that govern space because we have to share space as Canadians. We have to share space with all the other countries in the world. And we have to do that in a, uh, a peaceful way. There's entrepreneurs, technicians, and project managers. So we run a lot of projects, different technologies. We work with universities that might be, you know, just around the corner from you guys. So I'll get into all of this a little bit later, but uh, I'll start by also letting you guys know a little bit about my background. So. I am an engineer. Uh, I went to McGill University, which is a, a university in my province of Quebec, and I went. Uh, I studied in mechanical engineering. Then I worked at two different companies before coming to the space agency. I worked at Pratt & Whitney Canada. They build aircraft engines, so for either airplanes or helicopters. And then I worked at um, Canadian Avi Avionics Electronics, or CAE, and they built flight simulators. So I was always really interested in flying and flight and, and space. So uh, after working at those two companies, I said, well, you know what? That's not my real passion. And I want to follow my real passion. I want to wake up every day and be really excited to go to work and not just go to work for a job. I want to be passionate about what I'm doing. And that's when I applied at the Canadian Space Agency and I got my first job there. So just so you can see what the Canadian Space Agency actually looks like, if you hadn't had a chance to come visit it, this is an aerial shot or probably from a drone was taken on a beautiful sunny day. And this is where I work. Um, this is the Canadian Space Agency. So a really cool looking building and uh, really nice to come here every day. Now my first job at the, the CSA was in robotics. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen this robot right here. This is Canadarm2. And at the bottom of the screen, attached to the bottom of Canadarm2, there is another robot called Dexter. Now, there's another place you may have seen these two robots, and that's on a $5 bill. 
So have your uh, parents, you know, maybe borrow a $5 bill tonight, say it's in the name of science, and have a look at your $5 bill, and you'll see these two Canadian robots. So my first job at the CSA was to train the astronauts how to operate these robots. Now here you can see different uses for, for Canadarm2. Um, you can see that there's kind of a goldish and blue spacecraft that's floating around. That actually has no people on it at all. It gets launched up into space. It floats around the Earth and Canadarm2 goes and grapples onto it and pulls it into station so the astronauts can get food, fresh clothes, um, new equipment for their science experiments. So Canadarm2 is really responsible for capturing that spacecraft and docking it to station. Another application you can see in the bottom left-hand corner is a, an astronaut actually attached to Canadarm2 and it's a very safe way for an astronaut to go from one end of the space station to the other because the whole, um, the size of the space station is about the length of um, a, a professional football field. So for an astronaut to have to travel from one end to the other, holding onto station with cables, make sure they don't float away. Um, Canadarm2 is just a really great, really great way for the astronauts to safely get around to different areas of the space station. So here, this is me. Um, in the two pictures on the left-hand side, I'm training Luca Parmitano. He's a European astronaut. And the bottom is Megan MacArthur. She's a NASA astronaut. And this is actually the simulator that we have here uh, in Quebec, in Montreal, at the Canadian Space Agency. And this is where I would train, along with my other colleagues, we would train the astronauts how to fly the robotics on the International Space Station. So the controllers and the computers, the screens, the, the whole setup that you see there is ex exactly the same as on the space station. Then on the right hand side, you have a picture of Bob Thirst, which I'm sure some of you recognize. He's uh, one of our retired Canadian astronauts and still does a lot of work for, for the space industry. Now here, um, this is the MMCM. What does that mean? It's the Mission Control Center Montreal. So in the movies, you know how you see uh, the astronauts calling down to Houston? Houston, I have a problem. Well, in Montreal, we have a control center too, and this is it. This is where we control the robotics uh, on the International Space Station. So if ever there's a problem with robotics, this is the, con the control center that deals with it. So uh, it's pretty impressive that just like Houston, we have our own control center here in Canada. This is a picture of me uh, doing my flight controller training in Houston. So I did have to go down there. I got to sit in the big room, the actual room where they called down, the astronauts called down to Houston. And uh, this is actually the robotics workstation in Houston. So we have one robotic station there where we're able to monitor uh, all the robotic operations that go on in space. Okay, now I'm gonna move on. I did... Um, robotics and training astronauts for a couple of years, but uh, after a while I wanted to try something new. So another really cool thing that we have uh, at the Space Agency is something called space utilization and Earth observation. So Earth observation, what is that? Well, it's essentially those two words, observing the Earth. And how do we observe the Earth? Well, we observe the Earth using satellites. So um, right now we have a satellite project uh, the main, the biggest picture that you can see on your screen, it's three satellites. It's called the Radarsat Constellation Mission. So it's three small satellites put together. And you can see in the light blue uh, kind of rectangles, it's scanning the Earth, but they're doing it together so that they can cover a bigger portion of the Earth and they can give a lot more information than just one satellite. The types of things that we observe the Earth for. Well, I already talked to you a little bit, bit about, you know, monitoring the soil and uh, climate change. So in the middle there, the bottom, you see a cyclone. So any kind of disaster, natural disaster that can happen in the world, we use Earth observation satellites and specifically Canadian Earth observation satellites, Radarsat 2, and we will use the Radarsat Constellation mission to observe things like the, the forest fires. And I don't know if any of you remember, probably you do, 
the Fort McMurray fires, that's a picture um, on the bottom left-hand side of your screen of the Fort McMurray fires. And Ca Canadian, uh, the Canadian satellite RadarSat 2 was monitoring um, those fires and helping the disaster response teams on the ground to figure out how the fire was moving, um, at what rate, and it would just help them to be able to manage that. On the bottom right-hand side of your screen, you see some flooding. That was flooding that happened about a year ago in, uh, in Texas. And the satellites, what they did was they took images of the earth so we could see where the flooding was heading, where it could kind of go off into a bigger body of water, or what the, the firefighters, firefighters, policemen, the army, what did they need to do to help the people on the ground? So that's a little bit about earth observation and the Canadian satellites. Now, uh, just about, a, not even a year ago, um, I, I changed jobs again uh, within the space agency. And uh, I went back to the International Space Station, so not training astronauts, but looking at something a little different. So space and the microgravity environment. So on the space station, there, there isn't gravity like on Earth. You guys all know the astronauts, they float around, and uh, that's a microgravity environment. And those effects that microgravity have on living things, not just humans, but on if they wanted to grow their food on any living thing, that environment has some funny effects. And right now, there's researchers um, who are looking to find how life adapts in space. And that's going to help us and all the space agencies get the knowledge that we need so that we can you know, stay in space longer. Right now, a Canadian astronaut, the longest um, space, the uh, longest an astronaut has been in space, Canadian astronaut is six months. And we want to make that longer. We want to explore the universe further. We want to go to the moon. We want to go to Mars. It's going to take longer than six months, but we need to understand uh, what effects that has on our astronauts so that we can keep them safe and healthy. So the group that I work for now is called Astronauts, Life Sciences, and Space Medicine. So I talked to you already about the astronaut part of it and keeping them healthy and safe. But now I'm going to talk to you about life sciences and space medicine a little bit. So life sciences, here I have, this is actually from the CSA website, so I encourage you all to go and you can click on each and every one and you can see all the details of all the life science experiments. It's really, really cool, guys. I really hope that you go check it out. Um, one, for example, I'll talk to you about quickly, Hypersoul. So Hypersoul is the third one on the list there, the ultimate tickle test. And actually, it's not really a tickle test, but what happens to some of the astronauts is on the space station and when they come back, from being in this microgravity environment, their feet get like tickly, pins and needles. And we need to understand why that is. Why does that happen? Because if it's gonna lead to something really bad, we need some way of making sure that we can, we can prevent that from happening. Uh, there are other experiments here like uh, marrow, the first one. So how bone marrow, your bone marrow is basically inside your bone, you have bone marrow and there's cells in there. And we need to see how those cells react to microgravity. So we need to make sure that the astronauts don't have any problems with their bones when they're in space. Because in space, you can't really go to a hospital if something's wrong. And that leads me into the next part, which is space medicine. Well, what is it? Well, space medicine combines different medical specialty, uh, specialties and it's basically the fact that we need to be able to examine astronauts while they're on the International Space Station. So if something happens to them, like I said, they can't go to the hospital. So on the space station, we need to have ways to diagnose them, which means when you go to the doctor, the doctor tells you what's wrong with you, tells you, do you have strep throat? Do you have a, an infection? Do you need to take antibiotics? Then we need a way to treat the astronauts for whatever problems they're having. And that's also like when you go to your doctor and he says, well, you need to take antibiotics now for the next seven days. So we need that treatment. We need to incorporate all those things because as we go further and further into space, the astronauts have less access 
to the same types of medicine and medical equipment that we have here on Earth. So we have to make sure that we have space medicine available to them on the International Space Station and on whatever future space vehicles or spaceships that they're going to be on. Okay, so going to university soon. I know you guys are all in elementary school, but what I wanted to show you with this is that although university may seem like it's really far away, it's really not, guys. And what you can see is I, you're all from Alberta and Saskatchewan, and there are universities. If you look at your home province on the screen, you can see universities that might be right around the corner from you. And these are all the universities in Canada that the Canadian Space Agency works with for different space projects. So these are really excellent universities if you're interested in space, because we actually do work with them. And uh, so as you can see there, there's one in Saskatchewan, one in Alberta that are identified that we have right now uh, ongoing projects with. So if you are interested in space, you can see it's really not that far away for you. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. The future, yes, the future. Who knows what the future will bring? Um, that's actually me at one of our exhibits, but even for you guys, who knows what the future will bring? So don't be afraid to dream. Um, you know, Chris Hatfield came from Sarnia, Ontario. He grew up in on a corn farm and he at nine years old was just interested in space after seeing the Apollo 11 landing and that sparked his interest and it shaped his the rest of his life to be an astronaut and be an advocate for space. So it starts as young as nine years old, guys. So um, if you have those dreams, follow them, and who knows what the future will bring. So thanks. And if you have questions, I think I'll pass it to my colleague here, and uh, we'll get that started. All right, thank you, Kamudu, for that presentation. So we're going to start the round of questions. Um, I'm going to ask. Uh, to each school uh, to uh, send a student to the microphone and I'm going to ask that, uh, that student to uh, give me a surname and then he can ask the question. So we're going to start that run of question with our first school. It is Emerald Ridge Elementary School in Saskatchewan. So you may ask your question. Hi, my name is Bennett and I'm asking what kind of procedures or safety regulations do you have before you can send the experiments up to space? Okay, wow, that's a great question. So there's a lot of procedures <laughs> to send something up to space. So the experiment, um, it depends what type of experiment you're sending. So I'll give you an example of one. Um, let's say we want to send uh, some plants to space, and those plants, we want to see how they grow in a microgravity environment. So we need to do, um, there's different levels of, of testing that we need to do to make sure that it's safe. First of all, for uh, the astronauts, for the space environment, for um, are these plants going to, you know, are they going to shed? Are they going to shed their leaves and the leaves are going to get caught in everything? And how do we manage that? So here at the Canadian Space Agency, we have um, sort of a these certification checklists and all the experiments have to meet um, the criteria on the checklist to be able to send something onto the International Space Station. So it's not like we can just send whatever we want, whenever we want. So once we pass our checklists here at the Canadian Space Agency, then they go to NASA. And then NASA has another round of checklists. But again, like I said, it depends on what it is. If it's something that's a living thing, like a, a plant, there's a lot more checking, a lot more validation. Um, it, are the plants going to admit you know, too much CO2 and what's going to happen to the air then? Because, you know, there's no there's no air like the air that we breathe here on Earth in space. So are these plants going to affect the air? Are, are they going to affect the quality of air? Um, are they going to affect, let's say, uh, the static on the, on the space station? So all those things need to be checked. Uh, another example is if you send, let's say you just want to send a sticker into space. That's a little bit easier. So the, the criteria to send a sticker into space um, like some of you might have at your school. I don't know if you have stickers from space, but here at the Space Agency, we have stickers and we can send them out to elementary schools. And some of those stickers have gone on the International Space Station. So the criteria for a sticker is just that it's a certain weight and a certain size. 
So you can see that it depends what you're sending on the station and then the level of requirements, um, it, it varies a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's move on to the next school. We're gonna ask now the uh, Weber Academy in Calgary to ask her a question. So it's your turn now. Um, my name is Claire, and in grade six, in grade six, we um, are studying democracy and government in GH class, and in science class, we are studying um, sky science and space. So I was wondering, how does the current government affect your like job in space? Well, wow, that's a great question, Claire. Um, question, 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 Claire. Actually, um, right now we just had our uh, our federal budget, so basically the government really affects um, what we do in space. Uh, the way that we work, uh, the Canadian Space Agency, we are a Government of Canada department, and we get all our money to do our projects. Um, from the federal budget, which just happened, I think, about a, a week ago or two weeks ago. So the Canadian government lets us know how much money we have to spend on space projects. So this year, uh, actually, we have no new money, which, um, which is okay, but it just also means that the government really affects whether we get to do more or whether we have to keep to sort of the status quo and what we're doing. So the government highly affects um, what, what types of projects get to move forward. And um, I think it's like that for all of the space agencies really uh, around the world. And the fact that we are national agencies, we depend on our government to support us. And uh, we depend on them for, to let us know how much money that we have to advance our projects. All right, so let's move on to the next school. We'll go to the Belmont School now. You, in Edmonton, you may ask your question. Um, my name is Eva, I'm from Belmont School, Edmonton. I'm wondering that how long does it take for a rocket to get to the space? Could you repeat the question again? How long does it take? How long does it take for a rocket to go to space? Okay, so um, Eva, uh, to a rocket to go to space, uh, it doesn't take very long at all. It's actually just a matter of minutes. Um, however, if you want to meet up with the space station, that takes a little bit longer. So for a rocket to actually break Earth's atmosphere and get into space, like I said, it's about maybe 15, 20 minutes um, ballpark. But to rendezvous with the International Space Station, then that space vehicle needs to catch up to it, get into the space station's orbit, and eventually catch up to the space station to dock. So that takes a lot longer. All right, so now we're going to move on to uh, CW Perry School in Surgery, Alberta. You may ask your question. Hi, my name is Berlin, and I was wondering, have you ever been told that you can't do your job because you are a girl? Okay, that's a, that's a tough question. <laughs> it's a good question, though. Um, personally, I think when I was a younger in elementary school and high school, I was probably told by my friends, like, oh, you think you can do that? Well, yeah, I did. <laughs> that was my dream. That's what I wanted to do. And no matter what anyone said to me along the way, whether I was six years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, it didn't matter. Because my dreams are my dreams. And no one can take that away from me. Just like no one can take away your dreams and what you want to do with your life. So if you are passionate about something, know that you will get there. Put in the work, study hard, and you will get there. But also along the way, the one thing that kept me going when people said things to me that I didn't like or told me I couldn't do it 
is I focused on the people, my mentors, my teachers, my parents who told me that I could. And that really helped me. And I think it's because of those people that supported me and those mentors. That's why I was able to achieve everything that I have today. All right, let's head back to Emerald Ridge Elementary School in White City, Saskatchewan. You may ask your question. Hi, my name is Adri. NASA is currently focused on spending a lot of time on the moon. What is the CSA's current focus? Okay, so the CSA's current focus. Uh, right now, we have a few really big projects, um, but you know, when it comes to NASA, since they have a very big stake in what happens in space, uh, we tend to, you know, partner with them. And what we do is, with, like all the other space agencies, is we want to partner with each other because we can't do anything alone. And that's the way it is in space. So if the European Space Agency has a project running or NASA has a project running, we want to work together. So like I explained before, the money that comes into each space agency, including the Canadian Space Agency, is determined by our governments. So sometimes we don't have the money to do things on our own. And the best way to do things and the best way for, like I was explaining about mentors, to get through something is to do things together. So with NASA, we like to partner with them. And if they are looking at going to the moon, then we are definitely going to be looking at going to the moon as well. All right, let's move on now to uh, Calgary at Weber Academy. You may ask your question. My name is Dominic, and my question is, how do you communicate with the spaceship that has been launched? OK, uh, so uh, Dominic, um, like I showed in my presentation, you saw that uh, Mission Control Center. And it's through those Mission Control Centers, whether it be here in Montreal, but mostly in Houston and um, when, well, before when the space shuttles were launching from uh, Florida and Cape Canaveral, there's a big control center there. So we use satellites, uh, telecommunication to communicate uh, with the either the astronauts in the space shuttle or space vehicles or uh, on the space station. Okay, let's move on now to Belmont School in Edmonton. You may ask your question. My name is Anne. I'm from Belmont School in Edmonton. I'm wondering, do the people at space are going to see test the machine being built first? I'm afraid we're going to ask you to repeat your question. We didn't hear you well. Do the people in space, the Argency test the, the machines being built first? Do you test the machines before you send them out? Oh, yes, 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 yes. So um, machines as in this, any, any um, what we call flight hardware, so anything that's going to go fly in space, whether it's an actual spaceship that's going to fly or whether it's just an experiment um, that's, you know, going to fly aboard a, a, a space a space vehicle, um, everything is tested. So there are numerous sort of regulations and procedures that we need to go through, but especially when it's a space vehicle, um, for example, the Falcon 9 rocket, that's the rocket that's um, used right now to launch various satellites, and we're looking at using that to launch the next space vehicle. Um, it's being tested, you know, just throughout the year. They have launches, they need to pass a certain number of launches to have a certain amount of airworthiness, which might sound like a big word, but it's a way of basically measuring uh, how safe uh, something is to fly in, sa in space. All right, let's head now to CW Perry School in Airdrie, Alberta. Hi, my name is Ariel. Who is your inspiration? Uh, thanks, Ariel. That's a, that's a really great question. Um, I think when um, 
Chris Hadfield had his launch to install Canadarm2. That was when I could really say uh, I felt inspired by one person, one individual. But um, what I encourage you, uh, all of you, is to find something inspirational about everyone that you meet. And then you, you'll never not feel inspired. So all my colleagues here, whether they be engineers or you know in different fields, that's okay. Everybody has something unique that they bring um, you know, to the table. And I encourage you to try to find that thing that's inspiring about everybody that you meet. And for sure, you're gonna have that one person like me. It was Chris Hadfield that really inspired me, but now I look to see um, the inspiration in everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, we're gonna do a last round of question and we're heading, we're starting that last round with Emerald Ridge Elementary School in White City, Saskatchewan. So you may ask your question. Hi, my name is Autumn. Uh, was your interest in mechanical engineering what led you to the CSA? Or was it your interest in the CSA that led you to being a mechanical engineer? Wow, okay. That's uh, actually, it's the, the second part. It's the fact that the space agency led me to, uh, to be an engineer. So I was looking at, um, I also looked at what I was good at in school. So in grade 10 and 11, I was in the higher math and I was really interested in physics and I was really interested in space. So uh, I never said to myself, oh, I wanna be an engineer and then I'll figure out later on what I'll do with that. No, it was really um, space that inspired me to follow a career in, in engineering. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, Weber Academy in Calgary, uh, we're waiting for your question. Hi, my name is Toby. Um, my question is, how old do you have to be to join the CSA? Hi, Toby. So um, there's no actual age requirement, but there is an educational requirement. So you need to have um, a degree uh, from university in engineering, or um, if you go back to my presentation, I think you guys will have access to it. Um, the second slide there, are all those different things, physicists, uh, biologists, geographer, you need to have a university degree. And typically you're around 23 by the time you finish a university degree, unless you're super smart and you go really fast. And But the requirement's not really age, it's, it's um, to have a university degree. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Belmont School, so uh, we're waiting for your question. My name is Andrew from Belmont School in Edmonton, and I was wondering what you thought of Tesla's new rocket program. Wow, um, I, I think it's great. Um, I think it's really cool when uh, private industries are interested in space. So private industry, what I mean by that is something, some company that's not a government. And what that means is it means that the general public, that a lot more people are interested in space. So if Tesla's having a rocket program, which to be honest, I'm really not familiar with, I think that's really awesome. <laughs> All right, uh, CW Perry School, you may ask uh, that question that will end that uh, third round of uh, questions. So it's up to you now. Okay. Hi, my name is Roxy and my question is, is it hard to be a female working in a male dominated profession? Roxy, that's a great, great question. Um, you know, for me now, it's not a problem. Um, but I, I have to be honest, I, I go into meeting rooms and, you know, there's 25 people there and sometimes I'm the only woman. And uh, I noticed that. I noticed that, but it doesn't bother me anymore. I think when I first started working uh, about 10, 10 years ago, I noticed and it bothered me a little bit. It bothered me because I felt like, wow, this is this is strange because it just I, I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why if I'm a woman and I could do this and I know other women women here that work at the Canadian Space Agency and they're 
really smart and capable. I just didn't understand why there are not as many women as men. But it never deterred me. It never stopped me. It never made me feel uncomfortable. It was just something I had to see and get used to. And what would be so great is for you guys in the four schools that are here, it'd be really cool to see some women and you boys too um, going into university in engineering, science, math, and come come work here as my colleague one day. That would be that would be phenomenal. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, everybody. So that's the end of our conference. Uh, thank you guys for asking very good questions. Uh, Kumi seems uh, very impressed by uh, <laughs> the quality of your question. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute you all, and you can all say thank you and goodbye to Kumi. Thank you. Thank you.